Welcome to another virtual Bible study. My name is Ron Shepherd. I'm honored to, to be the teacher. We spent seven weeks looking at the first six chapters of the book of Daniel. Today we're going to start a new series from Tim Keller's book, Encounters with Jesus, Answers to Life's Big Questions. But before we start, I want to welcome you back, but I do have a few announcements. Again, if you have any prayer requests or issues, please send them to Paul at 1stchristianchurch.com. The elders, the staff, and Randy will pray for those concerns. We hope you'll join us this Sunday on Facebook, 11 o'clock, for virtual worship. The church continues to fund its programs and missions. So there's three simple ways of giving. One, go to 1stchristianchurch.com. Click the Give button. There will be instructions directing you how to give. Two, you can go to 1STCC73256 for texting. Or three, you can simply use the U.S. mail. So today, there will be a series of questions, and whether you're watching at home by yourself or with a friend or family members, you can stop the video, and I would encourage you to write these questions down, and at some point after the study, talk about them. Because here in the sanctuary, there is nobody but my nephew, Seth, and Laura, and Tony. But I think these are questions that are worth discovering. So before we take a look at these questions, let me read our scripture today, which will be found in the first chapter of John. John chapter 1. I'll read three verses, and then I'll skip, and I'll go to verse 43. But John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Then go with me, if you will, please, way over to verse 43. I'll pick up in verse 43. The next day, four, day, four days have passed. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathaniel, Nathaniel excuse me, and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Well, come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in him in whom there is no deceit. Well, how do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under that fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So let's take a look at some of life's big questions. And they're out there. So number one, in life's big questions, where should you look for answers? Where shouldn't you look for answers? And I think that would be a great discussion point for those of you who watch this video. Was there someone in your life who made a positive, gigantic impact? So let me share a personal story that for me was a life changer. And I'm guessing that there has been somebody in your life, a family member, a teacher, a colleague, a neighbor, a friend, that made a positive impact on your life. I was a freshman at Indiana University, 1960. My grades were terrible. My mom and dad could not really help me. My dad had dropped out of the eighth grade and became a boot black in a barber shop in North Vernon, Indiana. My mom graduated from high school in 1917. Neither one had college experience. So they really couldn't help me with my academic problems. 
But my dad thought of somebody in the shirt factory business who might help. His name was Ben Raskins. He had a master's degree from Cornell University in business, and he was vice president of the firm that had bought out the local shirt factory. So dad asked Mr. Raskin, would you help my son Ron? He's struggling. Mr. Raskin said, sure. So one Sunday after church, I met with Mr. Raskin up at the local soda fountain shop, Rexall Drugstore. And over a chocolate soda, Mr. Raskin told me the following, never cut class. You go to class every day that class is in session. Take copious notes. Whatever the prof says, you write down. If he says read chapter three, you read chapter three and you take notes. And here's the life-changing counsel from Ben Raskin that changed my life. If the professor says that the midterm is October 1st, you start studying September 1st, half hour, 45 minutes each night leading up to the midterm. By that time, you will have covered the book and the lecture notes. If there's a review session, go. That counsel changed my life. All my grades, along with a lot of prayer, were brought up thanks to the impact that Ben Raskin gave me. There are people in your life, in my life, that changed our lives. And we'll see that today. Life encounters with Jesus. But two, what about your hometown? Does your hometown have a nickname? Does it have a reputation? You're looking right now at a picture of John Mellencamp, graduate of Seymour High School, 1970. This is his mural uh, outside Seymour. Now, if you look real close, you may see a picture of me. Not, you can't lie in church, right? I didn't make the cut. I graduated in 1960. Mellencamp graduated in 1970. But Seymour, Indiana, a small town, which is what he used for his hit song, I was born in a small town, has a reputation. Not just because John Cougar Mellencamp, but it's also called the crossroads of southern Indiana. It's where US 31 and US 50 cross. It's where the B&O Railroad and the Penn Central Railroad cross, and it was also the site of the first train robbery in American history in October 1866 by the Reno gang. So Seymour has a reputation. But what about that mighty hot dog, that Frankfurt hot dog? I taught at Frankfurt High School from 1965 until 2001 when we moved to Temple, Georgia. And when people would ask me, you still teaching? Yeah, where? Frankfurt. Oh, that's the home of the hot dogs. The hot dogs were famous throughout the state of Indiana for that nickname, the fighting hot dogs. Fight you weenies, fight you weenies, hot dogs, hot dogs. Every town has a reputation, and we're going to study that today with the town of Nazareth. So let me ask you this question. Whether it's about stereotyping towns or stereotyping people, how do you overcome stereotyping, whether it's against people or a company or an idea? Why does prejudice, a preconceived opinion, that's not based on reason or actual experience, why does that exist in our society today? Well, I hope that we can answer these questions. So we've read the first three verses of John chapter 1. John tells us in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Eugene Peterson's Bible, The Message, summarized those first three verses in the following way, and he says it much better than I can, in the words of John Eugene Peterson. In Genesis, God spoke creation into existence. He spoke and heaven and earth were created along with oceans and streams, trees and grass, birds and fishes, animals and humans, everything, both seen and unseen. But somewhere along the line, something went badly wrong. The world and mankind were in need of fixing. So. God speaks again this time through his only son, Jesus. Jesus comes to earth in human form to dwell among us. He will speak salvation to mankind 
as the word of God became flesh. Jesus will speak salvation. He'll speak forgiveness and judgment, healing and illumination, mercy and grace, joy and love, freedom and resurrection. Everything broken and fallen, everything sinful and diseased are now called into salvation by God's spoken word. Salvation in the form of and the life of Jesus, the word of God. So here we have the word of God in human form, Jesus, born in Bethlehem. He dwelt among us. And that phrase dwelt among us means he pitched his tent. This is where he put his tent and he tabernacled with us. And we see the Godhead described, Jesus and God together being separate. We'll pick up the Holy Spirit later on in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. But we see here God and Jesus as separate entities and personalities. Now to the Greeks, the world had to have order. It had to be rational. It had to have a moral purpose. And I think what John is telling us is that Jesus in the Word gives us a rational and moral order. It's a reason for existing. It's our purpose. The Greek word there is telos, T-E-L-O-S. In Jesus, we have a purpose and reason for life. Not a philosophy, not a doctrine, not psychology, not logic, not debate. A person. True life, life's true meaning is with Jesus in a personal relationship. The term there is logos, a divine reason, logic, and purpose. It's in a purpose. So life's questions, you seek answers. Perhaps those answers can best be defined and answered for you in a person, a logos, Jesus. So here we have an encounter. And this encounter is going to be with a skeptic, a man who may be prejudiced, a man guilty of stereotyping, maybe even, as one commentator said, a snob, and that man is Nathaniel. Now, when you go to verse 43, this is going to be day four in the book of John, chapter one. Four days have passed. Jesus went to the Sea of Galilee. He went to a town of Bethsaida. It's the home of Philip, Andrew, and Peter. And Luke chapter 10 says, while in Bethsaida, Jesus performed many miracles, but the people felt threatened, and the town rejected Jesus his messages, and his ministry. Prior to verse 43, Jesus has recruited Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, and he even will give Andrew, or he will even give Peter a new name. He's going to change the name from Simon to Kephas, Peter. So Jesus found Philip, and he told him, follow me. That's it. Follow me. And what does Philip do? He follows him. I think a great question to discuss after the taping would be, what did Philip see in Jesus? What did he hear in Jesus that caused him to want to follow? So Philip finds Nathanael and tells him, we found the Messiah, the one whom Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, and he comes from Nazareth. Now recall, towns have a reputation. Okay? Notice Nathanael's skepticism and prejudice. Can't you just hear his tone of voice? How can anything come from Nazareth? Well, it's a backwater town. It's a town full of people with poor morals. Those people there have bad attitudes. It even has a nasty Roman garrison. Come on, man. How can anything good come from that town? Fred Craddock was distinguished professor of New Testament the Chandler School of Theology at Emory for years. And he says this about Nathaniel's skeptical remark. He said, you know what? Nathaniel's response may have been natural. After all, what is this man's credentials? Who's his family? What's his education? What does he do for a living? <laughs> Just look where he comes from. So I don't want to be so critical of Nathaniel. Nathaniel's just being human, because this guy comes from Nazareth. So. Jesus is identified by his home town. And it may be the victim of prejudice there 
on Nathanael's part. Now recall Nazareth. Joseph had taken his family to Egypt to escape the death penalty of Herod. They'll move back to Nazareth after Herod dies, and Jesus will live there for some 30 years before he starts his three-year ministry. But, if I may coin a phrase, Jesus lived on the wrong side of the tracks. Now, I mentioned a little bit ago that Seymour had a reputation. The B&O connected Cincinnati with St. Louis. The Penn Central connected Louisville, Indianapolis. The B&O divided Seymour. Now, the parents of the folks who lived on Carter Boulevard, the parents of Jim Proctor and the Highways and Kurt Bruce and Ronnie Shepard and Don Miller and Steve Downing, Ray Shortridge, Stan Dittmer, our parents would not let us cross the B&O because when you crossed the B&O, you were in a territory controlled by the Milwaukee gang. Now, I got to be honest, we never saw the Milwaukee gang. I don't know if they existed, but they did in the minds of our fathers. And so when Oscar Miller and Doc Shortridge and Mr. Downing and Roger J. Shepard said, you will not cross the B&O and get over in the Milwaukee gang, that's the wrong side of the tracks, you didn't cross. But you know what? I think Jesus was proud of his name. You know, it says in Scripture, he'll be called a Nazarene, Matthew chapter 2, verse 23, he shall be called a Nazarene. Jesus often was known as Jesus of Nazareth. His followers were often called Nazarenes. And in Acts chapter 22, verse 8, when he encounters Paul on the road to Damascus, Paul says, who are you? And Jesus says, I am Jesus of Nazareth. I think Jesus liked his hometown. But let's go back to Nathaniel. Can't you just hear him saying to Philip, you're telling me this man from Nazareth is the Messiah, that he has the answers to life's questions? No way. And can't you just see his eyes roll and his body language? I mean, th nothing good can come from this town. Come on, man, really? You want me to believe that this is the long-awaited Messiah? I don't think so. And then the question comes, how do you overcome one's prejudice? How do you overcome a person's prejudice against God, against his word, against his church, when you witness to people? Because those skeptics and those doubters and those folks who are prejudiced, they're out there. Now, skepticism still exists today in our country. Some folks are skeptical about Christianity, God, Jesus, the Bible, the church. And that causes this, me to ask this question. What causes skepticism? And what might you do? What might I do? What might we do as a church to help them overcome that skepticism? And listen, skeptics have been around forever. Remember, skeptics doubted Columbus could find the new world. Skeptics did not think the Brits could survive 50 nights of constant bombing during the German Blitz in World War II. Skeptics did not think that Truman could defeat Dewey. Skeptics did not think that NASA could land a man on the moon at the end of the 1960s. Skeptics did not think that communism and Stalinism would ever die out. And skeptics thought, would the Chicago Cubs ever win another World Series? Yes. Took them 108 years, but the Cubs convinced the skeptics we did, and we won the World Series. So, notice what Philip does and does not do to Nathaniel's skepticism. He doesn't argue. He doesn't get into a debate. He doesn't use logic or reason. He doesn't pull up a commentary and try and sit him down and, and witness to him. No. Here's what Philip says. Come and see for yourself. Come and see for yourself. You know, there's something we can learn about Philip in witnessing the skeptics, folks who are prejudiced. Let me give you an example. Addis Huxley was a famous British author in the 30s and 40s. He was an agnostic. 
He didn't believe you could prove God. And he was a skeptic of Christianity and the church as practiced in England. He was author of the book Brave New World, written in 1931, which is a scary book about how technology gets in the hands of a few people. And because they have this technology and this knowledge, they have power to control people's lives. Brave New World, 1931, scary. But Huxley was visiting with a good friend and his family outside of London. And it was Sunday morning, and the family was going to church. And Huxley asked his friend, I, I want to ask you a question. Would you stay home today and not go to church? And the man said, why? I want you to stay with me and tell me why you believe in Jesus, why you believe in his church. What has Jesus done for you? The man says, okay. Two hours passed. And the man told him everything he could about Jesus and what Jesus and the church meant to him. In Huxley's diary that night, here's what he wrote. In tears, in tears, this agnostic skeptic in tears wrote the following. I would give my right hand, my right hand, right hand, if only I could believe what you've told me. So let me ask you this. If a friend asks you, once we get back, if a friend asks you to skip church and go uptown on the square and have a coffee and tell him what Jesus means to you, would you go? Would you buy the coffee? But most importantly, what would you say that Jesus means to you and has done for you? Well, let's get back to Nathaniel, okay? Jesus says to Nathaniel, Nathaniel, I saw you under the fig tree, and you're a true Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Now, Nathaniel will believe based on that. And fig trees are important here. Fig trees in Israel provided great shade and were often used by folks who wanted to be alone and meditate. So back in 2015, you may have seen that film, The War Room, where this lady would go into this little room and isolated in quiet time, she would pray to God. It may very well be that fig tree was Nathaniel's war room. That's where he went to meditate and pray and cry out to God and ask God and pray to God. And that's where Jesus saw him. And so Jesus may be saying, Nathaniel, you believe just because I saw you under a fig tree? Hold on, brother. Slow down. Because originally you rejected me because I came from Nazareth. And now because I saw you in your war room, you believe? You want to follow me? Okay, listen up. If you're going to follow me, you need to get to know me up close and personal. Now, Jesus doesn't say this next line. But it's going to take three years. It's going to take three years of intensive instruction. But in verse 51, Jesus says, you believe? Okay, Nathaniel, then you're going to see heaven open and angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man, going up and down a ladder. In Genesis chapter 28, verse 12, Jacob was asleep. He had a vision. He had a vision of this ladder that went from earth to heaven, and angels were going up and down up and down. I think the symbolic image there is Jesus is telling Nathaniel and you and me, I'm going to be that ladder. I'm going to be that direct ladder that will connect you with my Father in heaven. I'm going to build a bridge and that bridge through me, by me, will give you direct access to God on his throne. This bridge, I think Jesus is telling us then and today tells us God still cares about his creation. He cares about his people, and he cares about his environment. Now, let me pause here for a minute. I am not running for public office. I repeat, I'm not running for public office. But here's what I think. I think at the forefront of environmental concern should be the Christian. Why? Well, if you believe in Genesis that Jesus and God created the heavens and the earth, and if they made us trustees of their earth, then it seems to me logical. Logically, it's our task to take care of Mother Earth. It's the only earth we have. Okay, that's the end of my 
campaigning, and again, I'm not running for office. But I think it tells us Jesus and God are involved. They did not abandon us like some people believe. They're still concerned, and that image of that ladder, I think, is our visual to remind us of that. So, life's questions are not going to be found in a bunch of rules and doctrines and rituals as practiced by some religions. So you're Buddhist. There are eight things you're supposed to do in order for you to reach your concept of nirvana. You're supposed to have the right views, the right resolve, the right speech, the right conduct, the right effort, the right livelihood, the right mindfulness, the right mental discipline for wisdom. Practice those eight day after day, and maybe you'll reach your nirvana. Or how about the five pillars of Islam? You confess daily, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. Two, daily prayers towards Mecca, five times a day. Three, giving alms to the poor. Four, the fasting of Ramadan, which, by the way, is the ninth month of the Islamic calendar and is taking place as we speak. April 23, May 23, we are in the holy month of Ramadan for the uh, is the Muslim faith. And last, if you're able to, one time during your life, the pilgrimage to Mecca. Hinduism, born, die, born, die, a repeated chain of birth and death to reach karma and heaven. The answers to life's questions are not found there. They're found in a personal relationship with Jesus as Savior and Lord. Remember, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man, no man comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 8. And so, Nathaniel, Jesus, the fig tree. Jesus knew Nathaniel's character then. He knows our character today. The good, the not so good, and the ugly. Do you believe that? Do I believe that? If the answer is, yeah, I do, then what does he see under our fig tree or our war room? If you believe this, then there has to be a response. And what is our response today? Now listen, do we walk away with tears in our eyes, still skeptics, still doubting as Huxley? Or do we walk toward Jesus in faith and obedience like Nathaniel? The choice is ours. So here's my challenge as we close today's lesson. What is one way I can follow Jesus more closely in the coming week? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this uh, lesson. Thank you for the lesson of Nathaniel, the lesson of uh, a town's reputation. Thank you for Jesus and his insight and his care. Uh, bless us as we study together virtually that you might be glorified and that we might be encouraged as our prayer in your name. Amen. Hope you come back next week. We'll do encounters number two. It's going to be about a woman and a man. One is an insider. One is an outsider. But they both have something in common. And that'll be encounter number two next week. God bless.